Well, here we are in session seven, the final session of this Firm Foundations course. I trust that it's been helpful to you up until now, that you've had opportunity to relate to your mentor, to ask lots of questions, and that if you look back over the seven sessions, I'm sure that if you applied yourself, that you'll know a lot more and understand a lot more about the Christian life than you did when you began. And so this final session is kind of like a wrap up and a where to from here, if you like. I'm going to talk about what it means to be a disciple, the life of discipleship, because uh, your discipleship, your learning, doesn't just stop with that session completed. Uh, once this course is completed, learning goes on forever. We continue to grow as we move forward. And so I want to describe the word disciple to you, because you would have heard us use that a lot. Um, and it's important to understand what that means. It's also important to know that we, we, we say we are Christians, but the New Testament believers, they didn't call themselves Christians. Originally, actually, Christians was a term given to them by outsiders. People called them Christians, and it was actually a derogatory term. Oh, you're those Jesus followers, those Christians. That's how it was put across. They called themselves, the believers themselves called themselves disciples. But they kind of took the word Christian and went, yeah, you're right. It was, you might be meaning it to be a derogatory term, but we are Jesus followers. And so that's how the term Christian came into existence. It came originally from people picking on them. But that said, um, we, we kind of lose something because the word Christian doesn't carry with it all the kind of temptations that we think it should. It, it really means a Christ follower. And so that is necessary. A Christian isn't just something you can be by, by birth. A Christian isn't just something you can be by going to church. A Christian means you're a follower of Jesus, a follower of Christ. And that's a disciplined life. And that's where the word disciple comes from. We trace our word discipline from the same word that they use in the New Testament for disciple. And my old pastor, Bob Foyster, when I was first saved, he used to tell, tell us that disciples are disciplined followers of Christ. In other words, you discipline your life to, look, to behave like Jesus, to become more like Jesus. You, discipline means fo- turning on sin and living for God. Discipline in your prayer life, discipline in your time in God's word, discipline in your behavior, discipline with your money, discipline, discipline, discipline. That's what makes a disciple. And we're very, I'm very grateful Bob's gone to be with the Lord now, but I'm very grateful Bob instilled that into Jill and I at a very young age that we are to be disciplined in our walk with God. So to be a disciple has a connotation of discipline, has a connotation of obedience. And I just want to read a few passages to you where Jesus and the New Testament writers make this clear. In uh, John 8, verse 31, it says, Then Jesus said to those Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in me, you are my disciples indeed. So he was talking to those who believed in him. He said, If you want to be one of my disciples, then abide in me, remain in me, be like me, uh, hang out with me, uh, discover what I have to say, do what I do, say what I say, go where I would go. That is how you will be my disciple. In other words, be obedient. Live like Jesus. Abide in him. Make his life like our life. And you will be a disciple. In Mark 8, 34 and 35, Jesus, it says, When he had called the people to himself with all his disciples also, he said to them, Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever... Uh, desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake, will, for the gospel's sake, will save it. Jesus said, if you want to be a disciple, it's going to cost you something. You need to deny your life. In other words, stop worrying about what you want, what's comfortable for you. This is why it comes back to that last session. Let's see why money is so important to God. It's because money is representative of such a big part of our life. He says, deny yourself and live for me. It was a picture of saying Jesus was going to, it was going to come a day when Jesus was going to carry a cross up a hill and get nailed to it after being whipped and flogged. It's a picture of pain. And Jesus is prophesying about his own death there, forecasting his own death. And he's saying, if you want to be a disciple, it's going to be costly. It's going to be a cross to bear. That's where we get the saying from. Everyone's got a cross to bear. If you want to be a disciple, everyone does have a cross to bear. The good news is that we don't have to bear the cross that Jesus bore. Our cross that we bear, the sacrifice we pay is infinitesimally small in comparison to what he bore. He bore the ultimate price so that you and I wouldn't have to. But there's a great joy, just as there was a joy for Jesus by by enduring the cross and coming out the other side and winning people to himself and seeking and saving the lost. 
In the same way, there's a joy when we bear our cross. When we deny what we want and take up our cross and say we are sacrificing our own desires and we are living for something greater. We're investing into something greater. That, friend, is a, passion, is, is a picture of passionate discipleship. In Matthew chapter 5, what we, the Sermon on the Mount, uh, particularly the first few verses of the Sermon on the Mount, we call them the Beatitudes. Uh, Jesus' statements about the Christian life and the blessings that come from living the Christian life. And an and, and interesting thing about this is that every one of these statements that I'm going to read in a moment seems contrary to what the world would teach or what the media would teach or what government would teach. It's almost like Jesus is saying, you want to be blessed, then give away. And you think, but the world would teach, well, you, how can you, if you give away, you won't have. And Jesus is saying, no, you'll actually receive more when you're a generous person. And so discipleship is actually kind of going against the flow of society. The world says, do a certain thing. Oh, look after yourself on a Sunday. Oh, you've got to look after yourself. You haven't got time to do that church thing. Discipleship says, no, I can't afford not to do church. Not, oh, I don't feel like being in church today. Let me let you know a secret. There's days when I don't feel like being in church. There's days when I'm exhausted. I've had a big week and I don't feel like being in church. Discipleship says, I need to be in church. Discipleship says, it's not about what I want. I'm taking up my cross and I'm sacrificing something and I'm going. That's the pathway to discipleship. It's the pathway to blessing. The world says, don't worry about it. Do your own thing. Discipleship says, no, I don't live for me. I live for him. He paid an ultimate price. He died for me, so I'm living for him. I've died to myself and I belong to him now. And the funny thing about that is that that's the greatest freedom. It seems constrictive. And the world says, well, how can you have fun? How can you enjoy life if you're living for someone else? But true freedom, true life, true enjoyment, true friendship, true love is only experienced in the process of picking up your cross and following Jesus. So let me read the Beatitudes to you. Jesus, seeing the multitudes, this is Matthew 5, 1 to 11, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, the disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In other words, if you're poor, if you're lacking something on earth, you have a poor spirit, God is giving you the kingdom. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who are hungry and thirsty for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. I love that one because people, the world says, look out for yourself. Tread on the top. Get to the, get to the top of the food chain however you can. You climb the corporate ladder by treading on as many people. Find the people above you and pull them down. The, 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 the world says, get to the top. Create havoc around you if you can get to the top. Jesus is saying, the ones who are the peacemakers, they get the blessing of being called sons of God. If you want to be a peacemaker, God will elevate you. He brings you into his family. Blessed are those who are um, persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. See, Jesus takes uh, the world standard. He reverses it on its head. He says, if you want to be a disciple, live differently to the world. Swim against the flow. Swim upstream. If all the pressure is pushing you downstream, a disciple says, I'm going to swim upstream. I'm going to go against that. And as you do, you'll find supernatural strength. You'll find that upstream is where all the blessings are. Oh, come with us. Okay, we're heading downstream to the ocean. That's where all the fun is. Jesus would say, no, no, turn around and go upstream because the greatest blessings, the richest life, the most fulfilling and joyful life exists upstream when you choose to be a disciplined follower of Christ, deny yourself, sacrifice something, take up your cross and live for God. That is discipleship. Discipleship also means to be motivated by love. John 13, verse 35, Jesus said, By this will all men know that you are my disciples, that you have love one for another. See, there's something about the Christians, when we love one another, that shows the world that we're his disciples. People see the way we interact with each other, and they're not used to it. See, in the workplace, like I said, it's climb to the top, it's, corporate, it's, it's the corporate ladder, it's survival of the fittest, it's knock everybody out of the way. 
Christians should be loving, should be the most loving people. Tragically, often that is not the case, but it should be. Christians should be the most loving people, and I want you to be part of the solution, not the problem. Be a loving person, reflect God's love, and be, um, and be that kind of person, and people will see that. And that actually shows them that you're a disciple. By this, will all men know that you're my disciples, that you have love for each other. Loving leads is a, is a key attribute of discipleship. In Luke chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, Jesus shows us that disciples get access to kingdom authority. If you're swimming downstream, away from God, you're out of access. Your access pass to the kingdom power is, is depleted. But when you swim upstream towards God, that's where the power is. That's where the authority is. In Luke 9, 1 and 2, Jesus called his 12 disciples. He called them to himself. He said, come and be like me. And he said... He, gave, he says he gave them power and authority over demons and to cure diseases. He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and heal the sick. When you're a disciple, when you're a follower of Jesus, you have access to power. Power to live right, power to bring blessing into other people's world, power to help others in need, power to bring God's kingdom down out of heaven and to the earth. That comes and is only available to the disciplined follower of Christ. And I want you to be one of those. So how can you be a disciple? What does it mean? How to what does it mean to be a disciple? How can you be one? Well, essentially, a disciple needs to be teachable. You need to be a student. You've been a student of seven sessions of this course so far, and hopefully you've asked lots of questions of your mentor or the person who's been working with you. You've studied, maybe you've Googled, maybe you've got some commentaries, maybe you've got a study Bible I talked about. You've started to become a student. Well, Discipleship is a lifelong lesson of learning. You'll never reach the point where you know it all. If you want to be a disciple, you must be teachable. Listen to what the Bible and some of the passages in the Bible have to say about this area of teachability. Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5, he says, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourself to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility for God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. You younger people. Now, I don't know what age you are as you're watching this. You might be in your 20s, you might be in your 60s. But this context here, he can be talking about younger in the faith. He's saying, submit yourself to people who are older. You might be being mentored by a person who's 40 years your uh, junior. But they may, be, uh, they may be 15 years your senior in Christ. And you can learn something from them. I'm sure that you'll be able to teach them things because you've got life experience that they don't have. But when it comes to the things of God, they have some experience that you don't. So don't let age be a hindrance barrier. If you're older than me and I'm still your pastor, don't be threatened by my age. I know I'm a young 41. I, uh, I look a lot older than 41. They tell me now, they used to say I look younger than 38. And suddenly uh, now I'm a lot older than 41. I don't know what happened there. Probably a bit of the belly that has got to be lost. And I've got to get on the bike and lose a few kgs from the face. That'll probably help me to look younger. But regardless of whether you're older than me or younger than me, I've been a Christian for 24 years. 1989, yeah, 20, coming up to 24 years. So I, I know a thing or two. I've learned a thing. Now, there's lots I haven't learned yet. I've, I'm always thrilled to listen to people who've been a Christian for 30, 40, 50, 60 years even. Um, I love learning from people who are further along the journey than me. Be a lifelong learner. Be teachable. Submit yourself to others that you can learn from. Don't be proud. God, God resists pride. Pride is so, is so abhorrent to him. He resists it. He resists proud, but he provides grace to the humble. So come to church. Come to your teaching environment. Come to life teachable and say, I'm here to learn. Teach me. I want to grow. I want to become more. I want to learn more. That is a, an essential attribute for discipleship. Now let me read you some Proverbs that teach exactly this principle. Proverbs 9, verse 9. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will be wiser still. Teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. So you can be wise and still receive teaching. You can be the wisest person and still not know it all, so continue to learn. So if you're a wise person but you receive teaching, you'll become even wiser. Proverbs 12, 1. Whoever loves instruction loves knowledge. I wonder if you love instruction. Most of us don't. Most of us, if we have someone come to us and bring correction and say, hey, listen, you need to change that attitude you've got. That stinks. Or you need to change that thing. Or I don't think you're praying enough. 
These kind of things, most of us don't like that very much. It's kind of uncomfortable. If someone comes and deals with an area of our life that's not right. But this verse says, if you love instruction, you'll love knowledge. But he who hates correction is stupid. <laughs> Can't say it more clearly than that. Most of us don't like correction, but we have to choose to love it. Even if we don't like it, we need to love it. If we despise correction, it says we're stupid. And you won't grow, you won't change, you'll, you'll put a cap on your life and you'll be butting up against the cap, a ceiling in your world. You won't be able to become any bigger than the person that you are now. So remain teachable. Proverbs 13 verse 18. Poverty and shame will come to him who disdains correction, but he who regards a rebuke will be honoured. Can't make it any more clear than this, can we? Be a teachable person. In Acts 17.11, this is one of my verses I use for this a lot. Acts 17.11, it's talking about a group of people who came from a town called Berea. And the Apostle Paul was travelling all around the region teaching people about Jesus. And he'd been to Thessalonica and uh, he preached and they hadn't received him very well. And generally speaking, they hadn't received him well. Then he came to this place called Berea. And in Acts 17.11, it says these, meaning the Bereans, the Bereans were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica. The NIV version says they had more noble spirit than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. These guys were teachable. The NIV version, which is what I learned in my Bible, it says the, uh, the Bereans were more noble than Thessalonicans because they heard Paul's teaching and they studied the scriptures daily to see if what Paul said was true. This is their attitude. They were teachable and they said, Paul, I like what you're saying. Let me study to see if it's true. Now, let me tell you, that's a very subtle difference. That doesn't mean you're gullible and you just receive everything everybody tells you. There's lots of preachers out there who, who preach in the name of Christ and they're, they're preaching wrong stuff. In fact, no, let, let me clarify that. Every preacher preaches wrong stuff. I will preach wrong stuff. See, I'm, I'm not there yet. I've just spent the last few minutes telling you that I don't know it all. I've still got to grow. I look at some of the sermons that I preached even two, three, four years ago, and I think, man, I was wrong about a few things, and I've grown, I've learned more. So you shouldn't just accept everything a preacher says. This verse explains the attitude you should have. You should take it and study the scriptures, do your own research, be teachable, and find out if it's so. Now, there's a subtle difference. Some people, they actually kind of, it's like guilty until proven innocent. Some people hear a preacher and they just dismiss it offhand. And if you dismiss it offhand, then that's not being like a Berean here. The Bereans said, basically, in essence, they said, Paul, I love what you're saying. Let me study the scriptures to make sure it's true. And if it is, I'm going to embrace it wholeheartedly. So they came with an attitude of wanting to believe it rather than wanting to disbelieve it. So stay teachable. Even if the preacher says some stuff to you that, doesn't, that you don't particularly like, it hits you in the face. Makes you feel uncomfortable. Maybe, maybe I'll preach some stuff and it'll, it'll offend you. In fact, the gospel's supposed to offend you. If you're not getting regularly offended in church, you're probably not hearing the word of God properly. Because the Bible, as we've already established, it's a mirror. And it should uh, show us where we, it should show a disparity between where we are now and where we, where we should be. So if you're not offended by the Bible, chances are you're not reading it properly. You're not listening to the sermons. Maybe you're dozing off in your chair. You need to listen and expect to be offended by the preacher. Expect to be offended, but stay teachable. Don't despise it. Stay teachable and say, Ron, I like what you're saying. Well, I actually don't like what you're saying, but I know it's good for me. I need to know it's true. I'm going to study the Bible and I'm going to change if I need to. Because that's how you grow and become a more mature believer. You become a disciple of Jesus. So, in conclusion, we want everyone to be disciples. In fact, the Great Commission, when Jesus went to heaven, he actually charged Christians with that. He said, Go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus' intention was that everybody would be a disciple. Jesus didn't say, go and make converts, go and fill seats in a church, go and make your church, churches as big as you possibly can, go and invite everybody to come in and give them a big feed, make them feel good, sing some happy clappy songs, and go home. Jesus didn't say that. Jesus said, go and make disciples. Go and make disciplined followers of Jesus. So our desire is that every one of you would be a disciple. But our philosophy is we can't force you to be a disciple. We can't enforce upon you that you must be a disciple. 
In fact, we are quite comfortable with you coming and being a part of our church, but not being a disciple. We are comfortable with you hanging out around us and just eat, not actually being a disciplined follower of Christ. Comfortable is probably not the right word, but you're welcome to do that. We will love you. We will care for you. We don't want you to feel ashamed in any way. We want you to feel like you belong. But we also, at the same time, will unashamedly say to you, we believe that kind of living is not what's best for you. The best kind of living happens when you choose to make yourself a disciple. We offer it, we urge it, but you need to make yourself a disciple. We use a funnel as an illustration of this. A funnel that looks like this and comes down to a narrow path. The funnel at the top is where it's widest. And that's like, that's like the people who aren't disciples. That's like our church services. That's like our outreach into our community. The wide open expanse. We say, hey, anyone can hang around the top of the funnel. It's open to anybody to come and join the funnel. But our desire is not, to, not, not that you would stay at the top of the funnel. Our desire is that you would work your way down to the bottom of the funnel. In fact, that's what a funnel is for. The funnel is designed to so you pull things in, they get concentrated, and they serve their purpose lower down as they come out of the funnel. The funnel is a picture of discipleship. You can hang around the top, but we want you to hang around. Hopefully you hang around long enough that eventually you'll find your way into a discipleship relationship. You'll work your way down. Now, discipleship relationship is, is, is harder. As If you pour a substance into a funnel, the pressure on the substance when it's in the bottom of the funnel is greater. It's compacted. It's more painful. There's going to be a greater pressure exerted. But that's where the funnel is most effective. In the same way, that's where you are most effective. When you are in the discipleship component of the funnel. That's where your life will be most effective. That's where you'll grow the most. We want you in the bottom of that funnel. How do you get there? Well, it's up to you. You can choose to hang around. And if you're a brand new Christian, you're just, you're just searching this stuff out. I'm not going to force you to get in the funnel. Hang around. Get to know us. Get to trust us. See what we're at. But at some point, our encouragement to you is that you will say, Hey, count me in. I want to be a disciple of Jesus. I want to be a disciplined follower of Jesus. How do you do that? Well, what you do is you choose to get involved. Last session we talked about the church. You choose to get connected. Large group, small group. You choose to serve. You get involved in serving. That's all part of pathways to discipleship. You choose to give. You become a generous person. You pay your tithe. That is a giving aspect of discipleship. That is painful. It's pressure. But it's part of what it means to be a disciple and you achieve your greatest purpose when you're a disciple. And lastly, you deliberately find someone in your world that you trust, that you look up to, who's further along the journey than you are and you say to them, I want you to disciple me. I want you to teach me. And then give them permission to speak into your world. See, I'm not going to, even though I'm your pastor, I'm not going to, I'm going to be reticent to come to you. If I see some issues in your world that need change, if I'm not confident you'll receive it well, if I think when you're at the top of the funnel still, I'm probably not going to come to you and bring correction unless you're being destructive and hurting other people's life. Then I might have to, to protect them because that's part of my job as a shepherd, to protect the sheep. But, but if you're at the top of the funnel, you're up here and you haven't chosen to make your way to the bottom of the funnel, I'm going to be very reticent to come to you because you're probably not going to handle it. You might shoot through, we'll lose you all together, you'll be lost to God, you'll be lost to the kingdom, your relationship with God will die, and it's not worth it. But we want you to be in the bottom part of the funnel. So here's what you do. You go to that person, you go to your pastor, you go to your connect group leader, you go to a person that you trust, and you say, I choose you to disciple me. I give you permission to speak into my world. I understand that you're going to say some things that are going to be uncomfortable for me, but I give you permission to say them. I don't want you to hold back. Tell me where you think I need to change. So if you do that sort of thing, I'll tell you what, any leader who has a person do that to them, they kind of go, oh, that's awesome. Because a leader's desire, greatest desire, is to raise people up, to make them disciples. And if you give them permission to disciple you, they will disciple you. But if there's a sense of, oh, you know, or if you say that and then they come and bring direction and correction and you just freak out a little bit, they're going to be more reticent next time to bring correction and direction. But if you suck it up and you say, this will be good for me, tell me what I need to do to change. Tell me where my life is not right. And then allow them to speak to you like that. I tell you, the more you do that, the quicker you will grow, the more effective you will become, the more effective you will become 
as a disciple. We are done. Let me pray for you and we're going to release you to go and do whatever you need to do. Heavenly Father, I thank you that at the end of this course that every person, I pray that every person would choose to be a disciple, would choose to place themselves in the effective part of the funnel, would make themselves a disciplined follower of Christ where they can be most effective where they can grow and become most fruitful. I pray you keep them teachable, keep them learning what it means to be a believer. I pray that they would grow and become leaders in themselves in coming months and they would lead others to Jesus. They would lead others. They would begin to disciple others, that they would not just be receiving discipleship from someone, but they would be discipling someone, maybe a younger Christian, maybe a friend that they've brought to Christ. You don't need to be that far ahead of them, just far enough ahead that you can reach by the hand and say, hey, follow me, come with me. That's discipleship. That's relationship. I pray that for every person that's listening to this. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, hey, thanks for hanging with me for seven sessions. It's uh, it's 11.39 at night. I've been recording these sessions pretty much constantly since about uh, 2 o'clock this afternoon. So I'm glad to have been able to spend this time with you. I pray it's been a blessing to you. Take my notes away, study them, write stuff next to them, ask lots of questions of your mentor. And the more you do that, the more times you listen to this teaching, the more you'll get out of it and the more benefit it will be to you. Hey, bless you heaps, and I pray that I'll see you in church soon.